Good morning. Welcome to the Academy's 2022 plenary session. Uh, it's live and Memorex, so you will be able to watch it again if you want. Uh, thank you for attending and for your support of the Academy. Uh, I'm Jim Gill, I'm a forensic pathologist, and I'll be uh, moderating the, uh, today's session. Uh, the chair of this program, uh, Doug Lacey, uh, could not be here today, uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, all the work that he put into this session. Uh, he deserves the bulk of the credit. Uh, after the three presentations this morning, we'll have a brief panel discussion. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our president, uh, Carl McClary. Uh, the last executive administration and his uh, have been centered around finding new ways to continue providing value to members uh, in a time of uncertainty around COVID-19 pandemic. President McClary has been working to place the Academy in a position to provide 24-7 content to both members and non-members. Uh, these goals led the plenary committee's direction of the theme of today's session, a, a responsive academy meeting and surpassing the challenges of a modern forensic science world. Uh, President McClary. Thank you for that, Jim. And good morning again, everyone. And Jim, I appreciate all of the tremendous work that you and Chair Doug Lacey have put into the program this morning. My theme that you mentioned, and I know, I know, it's a long theme. <laughs> I tried to shorten it, it just didn't work. I needed every word, and I think every word is extremely important to it. At any rate, in developing it, I began with an initiative that was started several years ago, that being the AAFS Connect on-demand digital platform. This was the beginning of a vision that I had for a broader outreach by the Academy. We as an organization have an abundance of vision, ingenuity, and dedication to forensic science. And we have shared that wealth for quite some time, but in more of a traditional way. And I knew that we could do more. We had to up our game. We had to extend our reach. We had to reach all of our audiences, our domestic audiences, international audiences, guests, students, everyone. And we knew that those who couldn't attend our meetings could certainly gain this content virtually. And that was my goal. Our modern forensic world and our members demand and also deserve a more modern academy as a foundation for that outreach. Today we will hear from two outstanding speakers relaying how new technologies directly impact potential evidence. And on the academy side of innovation and responsiveness, you will also be formally introduced to our executive director, Donna Grogan, who has embraced our operations and our mission in an impressively short period of time. And I'm so pleased to have us with us today and to formally introduce you. I introduced her. I thank all of them for their contributions today and to all of you for your support. Both of, all of those here in Seattle and those of you who are watching us online. And to those of you watching and participating online, you are a part of my vision, and I appreciate that. You are helping us to move onward. Jim. So forensic uh, practitioners are continually searching for proven methods of analyzing an ever-changing landscape of potential evidence uh, and must actively learn to apply new technology to, uh, to traditional uh, evidence. One of the most important avenues of learning these new methods uh, and technologies is through scientific presentations and workshops such as the, the Academy puts together. In order to meet these needs, the Academy's operational efficiency needs to keep up with the evolution of technology and expand benefits uh, to our membership. In June of 2021, the Academy welcomed a new executive director, Donna Grogan. She brought with her prodigious experience in organizational leadership, management, training and development, uh, and notable successes in fundraising programs. A high energy, 
goal-oriented manager. Donna has been using her experience to implement changes that will allow the Academy to achieve even greater success uh, for the forensic science community. Her talk is a more modern Academy. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, we were talking yesterday about how gracefully I could hop off the stool and address. So hopefully I, <laughs> I did my mother proud. <laughs> Um, I wanted to share just a little bit about me um, outside of the terrific introduction that was given of me. But um, I just wanted to let you know, I've been working in the nonprofit arena for about 26 years, hate to admit that. I spent the last 25 years working with healthcare nonprofits, um, advocating and fundraising for people with cancer and people with lupus. And I was struck last night um, in the diversity um, seminar, the forum that we had, the one Kelly Knight was talking about inclusion and she brought up people with invisible disease. And I spent seven years advocating for people with lupus in the workplace. And so it really, um, the inclusivity piece really kind of um, it, it hit me from that perspective. Um, I've been involved with and led change management, um, reorgs in organizations, brand renewals, um, website launches, CRM implementations, corporate sponsorship. I worked a lot with pharmaceutical companies um, for the good or the bad over uh, the last 10 years, um, and donor development. So what does that say? That says for me that relationships are really important to me. And COVID has kind of um, halted my ability um, to form relationships that, the way that I would typically form them with the membership of the organization, but I'm, I just wanna let you know how excited I am to be here in person um, and to meet everybody. So if you see me, just stop me, um, chat with me. Uh, I have two cats, I love cats. Um, uh, so that's another thing about me. Um, and when I took the job actually in 2020, I actually said 2021 the other day too, and someone reminded me, no, no, it was 2020. Um, I lived in DC and I lived there for a year where I uh, tried my hardest to sell my condo in DC and buy a house in Colorado, which as you guys all know, the housing market is insane. And so it kept me there for an extra year, but um, thankfully the remote world was embraced by everybody and it worked out just fine. Um, and I just want to let you all know as scientists, I've been working with scientists my whole career, and I have tremendous respect and admiration for all of the work that you do and the education and the time and the passion that you have for your, your specific disciplines. Um, and, you know, with all of the change that is happening in the academy, and it has been a lot in the last um, 18 months, I couldn't do this job without the support of my whole team, um, who have a lot of years in history with the academy. And so I really lean on um, those people um, that I surround myself with to help me with the history, um, to make sure that we don't make any major missteps. Um, and we have lost staff over the last year and a half, and um, so we've hired. We have five new members of our team that we've brought in over the past year, um, each of them equally engaged and energized, I think, by the vision that both the board and I have for the organization and really how we can move forward. Um, and I'm going to promise you that I may not get everything right when I do it, um, so I'll apologize in advance. Um, but I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to continue to bring change and ideas that make the already great Academy even greater. So now on to the ways that we're making the Academy more modern. I think this is my, is this my clicker? Is it the green? Oh. Ah. Technology. <laughs> okay, so the first thing we did um, when I joined was um, a strategic plan. Uh, there hadn't been a strategic plan, I think, since 1996 that we were really strongly following. So I want to start by saying, I heard this quote, and I think it's so good, change is hard, but change is good. Um, and I worked with um, a change management uh, consultant years ago, and he talked about this whole 
compendium of people are like, yeah, I want change, I want change. And then they kind of go through this little mourning phase of all the changes they have to make because they realize that they've got to be the change. <laughs> they can't just let everybody else do it for them, that they've got to do it as well. And so it gets hard, um, you know, moving spreadsheets into data, you know, into actual CRMs or AMSs. Um, you know, those are the things that people get really comfortable with because they know, I know I can re rely on this. And so you kind of have to let go and really trust. Um, so what, where we started was with um, a brand new strategic plan for the academy. And we have a new vision, mission, and values. And we did that in conjunction with our long-term planning committee, the board, and the staff. And this is really gonna be the blueprint for us over the next five years. Our main strategic goals are marketing, leadership, sustainability, and education. And each of these goals have tactics, or each of these goals have tactics to support the overall strategic goals. So from a membership perspective, you know, there are things that we want to do from a student perspective, um, bringing in more students into the organization, really looking at that next generation of forensic scientists. From a marketing perspective, we hired our first digital marketing specialist, um, and we actually have um, a brand and a communication strategy from a digital perspective. From a leadership perspective, that takes on, uh, that encompasses everybody in the organization, from the board to the staff and to our members, and how we represent the academy in the community. And then also, uh, what we can do from an advocacy um, standpoint, um, up, you know, up on the hill, um, in terms of working um, to encourage more um, focus on forensic science and recognize the importance on all of the research that you are doing. And then from sustainability, we, we obviously want to be financially sustainable, so looking at ways that we can create programs that will um, help maintain the already healthy uh, organization that we are. And then education is a key piece. Carl mentioned AAFS Connect. Uh, and we, over the next year, plan to really focus on um, the educational content that we can push out to our members and non-members alike. And then in addition to the strategic plan for the academy, we also created one for the Academy Standards Board as well. So um, the next step after the strategic plan was, I'm wearing Kevlar, everybody, I just want you to know, um, our new branding. <laughs> Um, our approach was digital first in creating this new brand. It needed to be distinct, accessible, and live up to its promise. And the mark represents multidisciplinary interconnectedness and movement for the future of the academy. So what you see here is our new brand, our new family of logos, and our new digital presence. And I will say that in looking at the branding, we're really proud of it because we had the AFS brand and then we had four other brands. And you didn't really know that they belonged to the academy. You had JFS, you had ASB, FSF, and FEPAC were all completely different and distinct and there was no way to really discern that they belonged to the academy as the parent brand. So we're getting social. Um, our, social, um, our social following has more than doubled uh, the followers on our social channels in the past year. Our next up for us is Instagram. And I will say LinkedIn is, um, is, has been a very popular uh, location for our content. Um, and so we appreciate all the likes and shares and engagement that you can offer um, as, you, um, as you utilize your own social media. And then we have JFS. So JFS um, started this before I even began, started with the academy, but they developed their own comprehensive strategic plan. And in that plan, their motto was the author is first. They really wanted to be, ha put the author at the forefront and they wanted to really reduce the review time, which they have done a very good job of. In addition, they've increased the impact factor 27% to 1.832 over the last year, and we're excited to see what 2021 brings for the impact factor. And um, 
The next is that we have an app for JFS, so you can get your content on the go. I know everybody says, uh, oh gosh, I have too many apps on my phone. <laughs> I say that all the time. I kind of get rid of them, bring them back, um, because you need them one time. Um, but this is, this is really great because I know everybody's you know, really busy. Maybe it's in your commute. If you take you know, metro or train or um, what have you, if you're on the plane, you can download it and read it um, wherever you are. And then we have new account portals for everybody. And um, this would fall under the, um, we, uh, we know that we don't always get everything right. <laughs> uh, we had a few hiccups with the rollout and um, we've had really great conversation with members about how to access the content, how to access the portal. Um, and so the next six months is really gonna be spent refining um, the member portal and making it um, as user-friendly as possible for everybody. Because I know that we, everything kind of changed all at once. Um, that's not how we planned it, but that's just how technology worked for us. And then we have the new AAF website. Hopefully you all have uh, been uh, looking at the new website and enjoying it, the content, and we think that it is gorgeous and beautiful, and the company that we worked with is, has put it up for a, a Webby Award, so we'll keep you posted to know if we're an award-winning website. Um, and we actually have metrics on our site. So on our old site, we didn't know who was going where and doing what and accessing what information, right? So we have metrics now that we can show who's visited the most pages so we can better tailor content to your needs because that's something that we really want to do in addition to creating uh, a newsletter that is, um, you know, different than the news feed, but a newsletter that feeds back into the website. So similar to what we experienced with the brands, we had five separate websites. So in redoing the website, it wasn't just one website we had to redo, we had to do five and merge them into one. And so I'm happy to say that it was a pretty seamless process and you know, it's the, the website, as you know, if you've ever built a website, is really never finished. So we're just continuing to uh, enhance it, make it better, uh, make it more user-friendly for everybody. And then we have FEEPAC. Uh, the FEEPAC is our accreditation program for um, undergraduate and graduate pro programs. And it first um, started with natural sciences, as you know, and just last year they rolled in um, criminal justice um, in, or crime CSI into the program. So the P FEEPAC staff are anticipating that within the next three to five years, we'll have about 15 new programs because of the CSI. And they're looking into evaluating PhD programs forensic anthropology and forensic nursing as new pathways um, into um, accreditation. And then abstract submissions. Ooh, another one, maybe I need to duck. Um, <laughs> we know that there were challenges with abstract submissions, but um, we had a great meeting with the program committee yesterday. We got a lot of really good feedback from them about um, things that they would like to see, ways that we can do better, and the good news is, is we have a whole year, well, less than a year, maybe nine months before um, we have to launch that again. So we promise we're going to get it to near perfect uh, for next year's meeting. And then grants. Um, this year, you probably have read, it's all over the website, we received our first ever uh, federal grant to the Academy, to AFS. And the um, grant is from NIST, and it's uh, it's going to allow us um, to create checklists, fact sheets, and technical trainings on standards. And so we're really excited because this is a way that we can really engage our subject matter experts and members in this project because there's a lot of work to be done. There's 75 standards on the OSAC registry that we need to um, work towards completing all of these trainings, checklists, and fact sheets. So if anybody has an interest in participating, just let me know and I will connect you with the SME in your area. And then we want to continue to work with um, CFSO, Ken Melson, I don't know if you're here. He does a great job as our liaison there and we're working on legislation um, specific to SDOs. So looking forward, um, that, that can be scary or that can be exciting. Um, we want to do another comprehensive member survey because we want to use data to drive the changes that we want to make for the organization, that you want to make for the organization. 
Um, education, as I mentioned before, is gonna be paramount for us this year as we um, try to um, encourage more um, educational content and webinars uh, through the website. And we want to grow our membership through a member-first mindset. Our staff had a retreat this last year, and that really has been our motto is member-first. You know, what is best for the member? And, uh, you know, for me, coming from a um, healthcare organization, we always put the patient at the center of every decision that we made. Um, and we're doing that for you as well. It may not feel like it always, but it, it really is there. There's a, you know, there's a large, this is a large membership organization, but we are really trying to get it right for you all. And we're gonna develop and implement an organization-wide integrated uh, communication plan. And our goal around the education piece is offering 12 additional educational opportunities on AFS Connect. Um, you know, I will say that um, under the International um, Committee, the International Affairs Committee, they had um, this year a group called the Global Collaboration of Forensic Sciences, and they've been working internationally on some webinars that are free content. So we want to have a healthy a wealth of information that's both free and paid um, content on AFS Connect. And as I mentioned before, focusing on the next generation, um, students, um, student academy, we had a great student academy yesterday. It was smaller than it typically is, um, but we were very excited by that. Our CSI summer camps, and then technology upgrades, um, we'll continue that, as well as our focus on cybersecurity. And with our Forensic Sciences Foundation, we're gonna be doing a strategic plan this year for them, and we're gonna be focused on donor engagement and enhanced scholarship grants. We had the FSF um, Board of Trustees meeting yesterday, and every chair went around the room and was like, I want more money! <laughs> because we've had an increase in the number of people who have been submitting applications for our various grants. And so we are focused on really enhancing um, what we can do to, uh, to help people with their thesis, to help people come to the meeting, to help people present their scientific information. So that's really important to us. And I will say that we've had um, some very generous uh, former members and donors um, in plan giving. And so that's also an area that we would like to explore um, in terms of um, large gifts that are bequests um, where people have left money to us. And then as I said, webinars. If you want to host a webinar, be in touch with us. There's information on the slideshow that's playing. And then, um, you know, Orlando 2023 and beyond in terms of where we're at with our conference, our an annual conference and how how we want them to go is we, how we want you to want them to go. Uh, we're really focused on our sponsors and exhibitors and the experience they're having. Um, we, you know, we want to make the exhibit hall fun and we don't want you to feel like you have to kind of bob and weave down the aisles as, you know, people are trying to attract you to their demos and different things like that. Um, you know, we have some really great sponsors and we already have some ideas. Because since this is my first live meeting, I didn't really know what to expect. And I have, as I said, five new staff who kept coming to me saying, well, what happens here and what happens there? And I kept saying, I'm not sure because I've never been. I've only been in the virtual environment. So um, I'm really excited about um, what, what lays beyond for us. Uh, with our conferences and the work that we're going to be doing with uh, the diversity committee on looking at locations um, after 2027, um, because that we're contracted through 2027. So after 2027, what are the areas and locations that are uh, LGBTQ friendly? Um, you know, what where you know where we can feel safe in um, you know the city. So we're going to be working closely with them. Um, on that. So with that, as I said before, um, I may not get everything right, but I will sure try my best, um, as I always do. I have a lot of energy, as I think <laughs> was said earlier. Um, and I just uh, want to thank you for letting me be here on the stage with these people who are going to be far more interesting than me. Um, but I just want to thank you. And again, like I said, if you want to chat with me at all during the rest of the week, please um, just grab me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Donna. It's great to see the Academy reaching out through social media, although I think I found a project for Laura, our president-elect, for next year, uh, TikTok. I didn't see it on the list. Um, 
Maybe we can do the, the Folgy dance or something. Yeah, or maybe Victor and you could do a dance or something. Um, so gun violence is not new in the United States, but the level of gun violence uh, has increased in recent years. In many instances, uh, fired cartridge cases, FCCs, uh, are the only physical evidence left at a scene. Historically, the ability of forensic examinations of FCCs to provide investigative information has been limited. Linking the FCC to a firearm through a firearms examination usually required the firearm. The techniques and technology have evolved uh, and now uh, allow laboratories to potentially provide information linking an individual uh, or a firearm or a previous incident uh, to FCCs recovered from a crime scene. Our next speaker uh, is Todd Bill. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry from Purdue and his Master of Science uh, degree from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Uh, he began his forensic career at the Indiana State uh, Police Laboratory in 1991 as a serologist, then a DNA uh, analyst, a DNA uh, technical leader and supervisor. Uh, he later worked at the Bodie Technology Group as the assistant laboratory director and vice president of special projects. Uh, Mr. Bill has been uh, the DNA technical leader at the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives Laboratory in Maryland since 2006. Uh, he will discuss the evolution of DNA analysis of FCCs along with the challenges encountered in the first two years after their implementation. His talk is DNA analysis of fired cartridge cases and the unique challenges they present. Much easier to get off a chair and a pair of pants. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank Carl and the Academy for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's, it's an honor. Um, I also want to apologize right off the bat. I'm a DNA nerd. I'm a lab rat. I'm not a gun person. So for all you firearms people out there, if I say anything wrong over the next 25 minutes, I apologize. Um, we started doing FCCs. You know, we started looking at it a while back. And we, we implemented this technology. And, we found out you know, along the way that there's a lot of challenges that go along with it. And it's similar to laboratories that implemented uh, doing DNA analysis on property crimes. And you're, you're adding a whole new evidence type to your laboratory that you weren't doing before, which you were probably already struggling with your backlog before. And now you're you know, opening yourself up to the uh, submission of a lot more samples, more diverse samples, and things like that. And FCCs kind of have their own uh, challenge with that. So, I'm going to talk about kind of how we got where we were and then some of the challenges and administrative considerations that we wish we would have thought of uh, about three years ago. So this is why we're here. Um, this is a, a security cam of an incident earlier, uh, well, previously. Over the course of about 10 to 15 seconds, nine people got out of those cars, fired over 170 shots into a public park. Nine different guns, and when I say over 170, we, we collected 170 fired cartridge cases, or FCCs, from that scene. And if it weren't for the security camera, that's about the only evidence that would be left at the scene would be the FCCs. And prior to not too long ago, we wouldn't have been able to do DNA analysis with those at all. And so, you know, this is something, you know, ATF, F, you know, firearms is in our name. This is a big uh, priority for us, and it's something we're really interested in. So, in case you don't know who ATF is, uh, we're a bureau within the Department of Justice. We're kind of the redheaded stepchild of the Department of Justice. We're the little brother of FBI. Uh, typical investigations are firearms-related crimes, uh, gun trafficking, shootings, things like that, but also arson and explosives. The E was added several years ago, but it's kind of the silent E because we're still ATF. Um, We've existed since 1886. Uh, our kind of mission has changed over that time. Uh, DNA capabilities were added in 2006. I was hired in 2006 to help uh, bring DNA unit online at the ATF. Prior to that, you know, 
DNA kind of concentrated on blood and body fluids, but there's not a lot of blood and body fluids for HEF type cases other than when someone gets blown up, then there's plenty of body fluids, but we really don't need the DNA for that. But once we got to uh, being able to trace DNA or touch DNA, all of a sudden all these, you know, being able to do DNA on guns, do DNA on uh, post-blast evidence or even pre-blast evidence, things like that, became important. So they started a DNA unit and they hired me along with three others, or two others at the time to start the DNA unit. Unlike most labs, uh, almost all of our evidence is touch or trace DNA. It's all handled objects or things like that. We do not do sexual assault cases. It doesn't come up a lot. We don't, you know, for those of you who do DNA, we don't even have a differential extraction online. So it's a whole, it's a little bit different. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about success rate uh, going forward through this talk, so I just wanna kinda of define that. We consider success, uh, if we're able to get a DNA profile that's suitable for comparison from at least one part of a piece of evidence. So if it's a gun, you know, we get a DNA profile from the grips or the front sight, things like that. So we may take five, six, ten samples from a particular item of evidence, but as long as we get a DNA profile from at least one part from that piece, we consider that a success. Um, just kind of starting with firearms, in 2006, uh, 2007, we started with kind of what was, uh, at the time, what we were using, and we had about a 20% su uh, success rate with firearms. So firearms submitted, about 20% of the time, we'd be able to get a usable profile from that firearm. Uh, we looked, we've made some improvements in 2012, we were up to about 40% of the time, and now we're between 70 and 80% of the time, we're able to get at least one profile from a uh, firearm submitted to the laboratory. And it's not unusual we'll get more than one profile uh, from, a, from the same firearm. Uh, different people, two unique profiles from the same firearm. These improvements came from changes in collection. Uh, we initially were doing one set of swabs for the entire gun. Uh, by doing that, you know, kind of with the thought of one person's handling the gun, you know, shocking the gang members don't have one, one gun per person. They've got their lucky shooting gun. Joe Bob shoots someone on Tuesday. Jim Bob shoots someone on Wednesday. And so the guns are getting passed around. First thing you do when you get a gun is you hand it to everybody and say, hey, look at my gun. So everybody's touching it. So by swabbing the entire gun, we're creating these huge mixtures, which makes it more difficult to uh, get a usable profile. Also, uh, so we started targeting individual areas, uh, targeting like fingerprints within it. We, you know, from a typical handgun, we target about seven to eight different areas on the firearm, looking for ridge detail, uh, the textured areas of the guns, things like that, trying to get single source or lower contributor mixtures. Uh, we also looked at our extraction methods, trying to improve the recovery from the extraction, uh, minimize loss during extraction concentration, uh, change amplification kits, which got more sensitive, and then interpretation approaches. You know, interpretation approaches have changed significantly since 2006, and so being able to do more with mixtures has really helped out. And this all kind of translates to what we're doing with FCCs now. So the community's been looking into getting DNA from FCCs for years. Uh, the you know, research goes back prior to 2010. If you look at that chart, not that you need to see the numbers, but it, you know, x-axis is from 2000 to 2022. And it's the number of publications during those years, uh, just you know, through a quick review. And you can see over the last five to 10 years, there's many more uh, publications in this area. It's become more of an interest to the community. If you do want to see a good review about this, uh, Sean Montpetit wrote a paper in Wires in 2019. Highly recommend that. But there's been several papers since then uh, that are also important that kind of introduce new uh, potential ways of collecting the DNA from FCCs. We started research kind of hot and heavy in 2011, 2012, uh, mostly from a you know, different perspective. We were working with a group out, in, uh, out west in Utah where they were uh, looking at doing peptide analysis from fired cartridge cases. And we, we weren't getting much results, so I said, hey, well, I'll spot some uh, cells on the FCCs. You do your thing, we'll do our thing. And they got a full peptide profile. Uh, peptides are more stable than DNA. And I got nothing. So my immediate reaction was I screwed up. So I kind of quietly set up the whole thing again, did it again, got no results uh, the next day. And we found out, uh, luckily being at ATF, there's a lot of big brains there that are chemists. So I can go talk to a chemist about what's going on with this. And they suggested potentially it's the copper. And this goes back, you know, years and years and years, hundreds of thousands of years, even in ancient Greece, they knew that there's something about copper that killed uh, bacteria and killed organisms. And basically, brass, or the copper in brass, reacts with water, creates these reactive oxygen species that degrades or oxidizes DNA, uh, proteins, whatever. And so that was kind of a big realization. And so we started kind of going down that road. We know there's many obstacles to getting DNA from fired cartridge cases. Uh, Obviously, it's a small area for a deposition to begin with. People may not be handling them that much as they're loading the gun. 
There's the damage caused by copper that I just talked about, damage caused by the firing process, and this goes back to some of the earlier papers, and then the powder residue. Uh, we showed that black powder residue actually causes an acidic environment that will also degrade DNA. Not, many, uh, not much ammunition actually has black powder in it. They usually use black powder substitutes, so that's less of an issue. But we looked into uh, the cause, this degradation being caused by copper, and we worked with uh, George Washington University, Daniele Padini and his students, and they were spotting cells in water uh, on brass cartridge cases, using a hairdryer to dry it and swabbing it, not getting any results from those. You know, the, the reaction happens very quickly. And we realized if you're swabbing, uh, if you're swabbing the DNA off the cartridge case, you're actually creating that environment with the water and the cells and the brass for this degradation to occur. So we wanted to find something that was better than that. So we looked at soaking methods, uh, the Montpetit and the NFI method, uh, tape lifting. We thought if we just tape lift off the FCC, then you don't have the water introduced. We looked at a whole bunch of different swabs, uh, nylon swabs, silk swabs, uh, polyester swabs, rayon swabs, cotton swabs, different kinds of cotton swabs, digestible swabs. We looked at fish skin, uh, different extraction methods, trying to optimize the amount of DNA we're actually recovering from it. When we're looking at the swabs, we're looking at how well they actually pick up the DNA and then how well they release it because if you think about it, you know, if a swab is really good at picking up that biologic material, it doesn't really like letting it go. And so you're losing a lot of that DNA. So we wanted to have some type of swab that would actually get the DNA off the substrate but then release it during the extraction. Um, we looked at direct amplification, things like that. Uh, eventually we did come up with the method that we liked and uh, we published that. And this method, you know, if you look at the top, uh, top left chart, uh, that uh, those dots, the lower the dots are, the less degradation. Uh, the far left where the, you've got that nice spread that goes all the way to the top, uh, that is the normal method using a wet and dry swab, swabbing fired cartridge case, a brass one. You've got pretty high degradation there. The other ones are the different additives that we're, we now add to our swabbing or our rinse method uh, to prevent the degradation. And basically there's BSA in there that just collects everything, and then there's a tripeptide that's specifically in the human body for binding copper and inactivating it. And then we use this rinse and swab method that we've uh, figured out that we're getting about three to four times more DNA off the objects as well. So we're trying to reduce the degradation, increase the recovery. In the meantime, we realize that you know, if, if you have very little DNA on the outside of the cartridge case to begin with, putting it in some kind of packaging where it's rolling around, rubbing against other things, you potentially are losing that DNA on the inside of the packaging itself. So we developed uh, this cartridge case collector that can be used at the crime scene. You scoop it up on a post, you put that protective cap on it, and it kind of suspends it in there so it's not touching the sides. It has some vents in there so it can dry during pack or during transport. Uh, we're working with a, a group in the DOD that can actually make these things. They were 3D printing them. Now we're going to be uh, manufacturing these things, sterilizing them, packaging them. The idea is we're going to kind of uh, give these for free uh, to all our NIVIN partners so they can have these if they want them. You'll notice this is all for handgun size because when we were doing this, you know, I thought everybody used handguns. Uh, again, not a gun guy. Turns out, depending on what city you use, some people use uh, handguns, other cities like 7.62s or 223s. So we're working on something for uh, rifles. So getting into the unforeseen challenges. So we, we got this, we thought we were all excited, we're getting DNA from this, life is good, we can start doing DNA on these FCCs. One of the biggest challenges was actually convincing people we could get DNA from the FCCs. Our own organization, uh, from direct run down, was uh, kind of skeptical about this from some of the information they were getting. Our own agents, you know, about the time we started getting DNA from FCCs and we were having the success, our own agents were telling local uh, agencies, don't even bother sending FCCs to lab, just send it straight to the NIBIN. And so we're, we're fighting within our own group just to convince them that we should start sending these things to the laboratory. One of the ways we figured out that we could kind of push this narrative and convince them that this was working is we start tracking the results. And so this is a kind of a snapshot in time from last year, but we've, we started basically from day one, we started collecting as much information as we could about the evidence that was being submitted and the results we were getting. And we were doing it in Excel, but every time I wanted to update it, it was kind of a pain. So we started using Power BI. And when I say we, there's a person downtown that put this together for me. And so I had to kind of stop the input uh, sometime last year, and we've been working on putting this Power BI uh, thing together. But now I just hit refresh, and these numbers will start uh, getting updated. So this just, we just finished this last week. But it tracks uh, the number of cases, the number of assumed firearms, and so an assumed firearm, uh, firearm in our brain is 
It's a drive-by shooting. 10 FCCs are left at the scene. From the witness statements, case information, caliber, things like that, we assume those all came from the same gun. So similar to if you uh, think of like a firearm, we may take 10 samples from that firearm. As long as we can get one sample that gives us a profile suitable, we consider that a success. We do the same thing with fired cartridge cases. If we have a set of uh, FCCs that we assume came from the same firearm, if we can get uh, at least one DNA profile suitable for comparison from that group, then we consider that a success. So for se from 77 cases, back whenever this data was compiled, uh, we figured out 132 assumed firearms, 77 successful analyses from those, which that's about 58% uh, of the time, we're getting at least one suitable profile from a fired cartridge case from that group, 60% um, of the cases. From those uh, 77 successful analyses, we've gotten 62 CODIS profiles that have led to 14 CODIS hits. And I just got an update uh, yesterday, so we're now up to 122 CODIS profiles and 30-some uh, CODIS hits at this point. So having this data to track and being able to look at this stuff is what kind of help us convince our own agents our upper management, the director, et cetera, that we really can get DNA from these. And the CODIS hits were important because it shows, you know, some of the skepticism was that, oh, the DNA profile you're getting is just from uh, the victim or the person who collected it, which that does happen. I'm working on that, but uh, it does happen. But being able to get CODIS hits and actually linking it to, you know, potential perpetrators or getting reference samples from suspects and matching it to those kind of convince people that these are probative profiles. It's not just, you know, some type of contamination. For our own benefit, we wanted to track uh, success rate per caliber. You know, are we getting results just from nine millimeters? Are we getting any results from 223s or 762s, you know, assault rifles? And so we're tracking this as well. So we're tracking it, uh, tracking the success rate per caliber. We're tracking it per metal composition, and we're also tracking the uh, metal composition per caliber. In the bottom right, uh, there's a pie chart that talks about the number of contributors, and this was one of the things that we were kind of surprised by. You know, in my brain go to the store, you buy your ammunition, you go home, you load your gun, and then you go out and shoot somebody. There should only be one person touching this ammunition. And so I thought everything would be single source. And shockingly, we started getting these results in, and the majority of them are mixtures. So if you can look at, and I don't have my glasses on, but I think the purple up there is for single source, uh, the darker blue is for two-person mixtures, lighter blue is three-person mixtures, and the orange is four-person mixtures. So the vast majority of the results we're getting are mixtures from the fired cartridge cases. And so that was something we really weren't expecting as much. So again, uh, kind of the, the fight within our own agency, uh, NIBIN. So NIBIN, the National uh, Integrated Ballistic Information Network, if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of like a, a database like for CODIS or for APHIS, but for firearms and for fire cartridge cases and guns. Um, it's run by ATF, and so they have a big kind of push to do this. They want all the FCCs, all guns, to be put into NIBIN. They want it done quickly. Investigators want the information very rapidly. They, you know, within 48 hours, they want you to uh, enter into NIBIN and provide those leads. ATF strongly encourages people to em uh, enter this information very quickly and get these leads out because the investigators want this. You know, there's a lot of data showing that the sooner you get these leads out, the you know, better the or more potential you have for solving that crime. But again, that kind of goes against you know, the whole DNA side. So they're trying to put stuff into NIBIN before we could get the DNA done. So that was a bit of an issue. And so we had to work with local agencies and within our own group of figuring out ways that we can kind of accomplish both because we don't want to you know, exclude some type of analysis. We want to fully exploit the evidence as much as we can. So now we have uh, a way to do that. We basically, there's different strategies and we can talk about those later if you want to, but there's different strategies of uh, getting the FCCs in doing the DNA collection right away, transferring it to NIBIN. Uh, you can peel off some just for uh, NIBIN and do the rest for DNA. We've now formed also an FCC group that specifically just does the collection and extraction of uh, DNA from fired cartridge cases to kind of expedite that process. Crime scene issues, uh, DNA analysis is not typically considered, and so you've kind of got the old school going in there where they just, you know, they're picking them up with their fingers or potentially not thinking about DNA. Maybe they're wearing gloves, but they're, you know, Washing, scratching their head, then picking up the FCCs. So the you know, DNA analysis is not top of their mind while they're doing this, so things aren't being handled correctly. Uh, it's obviously difficult to collect these things without touching the surfaces, so it's another reason we wanted to use this collector, we developed this collector, the old school Perry Mason, with the, take the pencil off from under, behind your ear, and you're scooping up the uh, fire cartridge cases, not good. <laughs> um, packaging the FCCs together, you know, it's not a problem unless one of them's just covered in blood. 
And then while it's in there, it's transferring all this blood to the other FCCs. That's going to overwhelm any touch evidence. Uh, we've seen this in the past with other types of evidence where we get this kind of blood powder transferring within the same packaging. Uh, damage, you can see the, you know, the, the screen, the damaged ones, you know, drive-by shootings, they leave the FCCs in the road, they're getting run over. We've almost never gotten results from uh, these FCCs. And then outdoor weather, you know, if, if they've been sitting out there during a rainstorm, not good. Uh, if they've been sitting there for weeks in hot, humid air, also not good. So these are all challenges that are a little bit different than some of the other evidence we've seen. Uh, we did some work to show that the DNA damage due to time and humidity, you know, we knew that water was an issue, reacting with the brass and the copper and some other metals. Um, but we needed to kind of figure out how that affected uh, the actual FCCs themselves. And so we did some studies, and I put this slide together, and I realized this looks like an IED. Uh, it's, it's actually a Chinese food container with uh, wet paper towels in the bottom, FCCs, and then humidity detector in there. Um, but it's, it's not a bomb, I promise you. We do make bombs, but that's for training, not for this. Um, but we wanted to see how this affected it, and we saw you know, just over a course of a, you know, a week or two, almost all the DNA was degraded on the copper uh, uh, FCCs. We got no recovery from those. From the uh, aluminum ones, we did get some, but it was a tenfold decrease. And so we can just see how this does affect things. So it affects how you're gonna wanna store these. Again, I talked about this already, the number of, uh, you know, the vast majority of the FCCs we're analyzing are giving us mixtures, so that's going to affect how we uh, do the interpretation and what we can do with that information. I will say probabilistic genotyping has been a huge benefit in the interpretation of this. Sudden increase of submissions. So this is a whole new evidence type. So if you're already struggling with your backlog, we were, um, now all of a sudden you're opening up to these FCCs that, you know, there's plenty of shootings out there, and there's not a, labs that are actually, or not a lot of labs that are actually doing DNA analysis on FCC, so you know, you're the most popular lab in the world. It's like, yeah, we'll do that for you. And so now we're getting calls you know, weekly, daily, on uh, laboratories or uh, agencies asking us to do DNA on these. And of course, they're all high-profile cases. These aren't you know, people shooting stop signs. These are you know, drive-by shootings, multiple homicides, uh, mass shootings, things like that. Number of FCCs per case. You know, I talked about that case originally. There were 100 FC, 170 FCCs collected from that case. Each one of those is a piece of evidence that you have to individually analyze, which takes time. It's adding to a current backlog, which if you're always struggling with the backlog, adding these to it uh, also is a bit of an issue. We don't have this problem because we don't do sexual assault cases, but there's a lot of labs that have uh, mandated by law turnaround times for sexual assault. So then how do you kind of put these high-profile homicides in front of uh, the mandated turnaround times for the sexual assault kits as well. So these are all challenges for laboratories. As of right now, we don't do uh, any type of late print development on FCCs. It goes straight to DNA because we don't want to, you know, wouldn't do much good to swab them beforehand um, before it goes into NIBIN and then on from there. But there are new methods coming out for uh, late print development from FCCs that are out there. Uh, we're hoping to work on that pretty soon, but they could be done potentially after DNA collection and uh, NIBIN analysis. So some of the administrative technical things, the type of case, I would, you know, case acceptance policy. This is something that you should, you know, whilst, while your lab's validating this, think about this, because this affects everybody. Uh, the types of cases you want to accept, only cases without suspects, potentially. Is there other evidence available? Uh, the time since the incidents, because I know that uh, the longer the DNA is on the FCCs, the uh, more degraded it becomes. Uh, the weather, what happened during, uh, between the time of the shooting and the actual time that the FCCs were collected. Have they been handled properly? You know, we get this all the time. We see pictures of, you know, they submit the evidence and they submit their uh, report of investigation. And you see the people at the scene handling FCCs in bare hands. And like, okay, that's, that's done. Um, willing to provide elimination samples. We try to require that uh, everyone on scene, or at least the people who did the collection, provide an elimination sample so we can determine right away if it is uh, contamination. Do you want to determine if there's a maximum number of FCCs you're going to do per case? If there's 100 F or 170 FCCs for a case, are you going to do all 170? Are you going to do a tiered approach? There's a publication a couple years ago saying that uh, the soaking method may actually damage the markings on the FCCs. And so we wanted to make sure that wasn't the case for how we were doing this. Uh, obviously, we don't want to impede the NIBIN. We don't want to impede downstream firearms analysis. So uh, we did start our own study a couple years ago. 
these are before and after pictures of the same FCC where we uh, took it before we did the collection, and then two years later we uh, looked at it again after the collection. You can see there's no changes there, and this is a kind of microscopic view of that. You can see all the, the detail, the markings are still there, so that encouraged us. Storage. Uh, this is something that we've been, you know, we've been worried about. If you can't get this stuff, uh, get to it right away, how are you going to store it in your lab? Our lab is notoriously bad for humidity, especially during the summer. So we've actually created a low storage uh, cabinet in our uh, evidence room to try to prevent any type of humidity issues and uh, destabilization or destruction of the DNA. We also try to prioritize the FCC cases, so we're getting these in and doing the analysis as soon as possible. Technical considerations, uh, laboratory process flow, you want to pick a method that works kind of with your flow. Look at your current extraction method, uh, the interpretation method. Be ready to interpret low-level samples. The median level is about 300 picograms of DNA, but for the most part, it's you know, less than that. Um, do you want to perform analysis on each individual FCC? Do you want to do them in pairs? Kind of like going back to the gun, if you're doing the entire gun, you're creating mixtures potentially, but you're you know, recovering more DNA, so you have to kind of weigh the, uh, those two priorities. If you're going to do, uh, how are you going to deal with large numbers? You're going to have multiple people attack them, do the tiered approach, and then deal with sample consumption. You know, are you going to use the entire sample? If you only use 50 of the 100 FCCs, are you actually consuming the sample, or are they each considered separate? So these are all things you need to consider. So uh, in summary, I just want to, you know, kind of spread the word. It is possible to get DNA from FCCs. Uh, there's a lot of methods out there. There's, you know, tape lifting, soaking, or dunking method, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's our, the rinse, rinse and swab method. There's an MVAC system method. But there's a lot of uh, methods out there that you can use. Try to find one that's best for your lab. But then if you are going to implement this, while this is being validated, try to think about some of these other considerations as you are kind of bringing this into your laboratory, because it does affect everybody. So, quick acknowledgments. I want to thank the laboratory staff, specifically Greg Pfeiffer, Glenn uh, Farrig, and Steve Weitz, and then Caitlin Chutrin, who's helping us with uh, Power BI, George Washington University, Dr. Padini, Penn State, we're doing a study with them also on the humidity and uh, time studies, and then the DOD group that's doing the manufacturing, and then Kansas, Kansas City PD and the Kansas Lab, uh, when we first rolled this out, uh, we did a pilot project with them, and they were very helpful with that. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Todd. Uh, our final speaker uh, is Andy Parsons, uh, who is the director of Adobe's Content Authenticity Initiative, CAI. Uh, this project is creating uh, the open technologies for a future of verifiably authentic content of all kinds. Uh, with collaborators across hardware, software, publishing, and social platforms, the CAI is empowering creators with secure provenance. For information consumers, this important work restores trust and transparency to the media they experience. Throughout his career, uh, Mr. Parson has worked to empower creative professionals with innovative technologies. Prior to joining Adobe, he founded WorkFrame, the pioneering visual project management platform for commercial architecture. He previously served as CTO at McKinsey Academy, uh, McKinsey's groundbreaking educational platform, and he uh, co-founded uh, Hap uh, Hapify, uh, the world's leading mobile platform for digital therapeutics uh, and behavioral health. Uh, any experience with TikTok? Yes, I'm going to talk about that. Talk about that. More. Um, any digital provenance is becoming one of the most important countermeasures against mis- uh, and disinformation uh, his talk will focus on how the Content uh, Authenticity Initiative is deploying techniques and standards that answer the question, instead of detecting what may be fake, can we prove what's true? Uh, from a forensic perspective, they will explore how the technology works, how it can, uh, may be adapted, and its place in the legal system. The title of his talk, or maybe we can call it Andy Parsons Project, uh, is Adobe's Adobe's Content uh, Authenticity Initiative, Digital Content Provenance in the Age of Misinformation.
Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I've had the privilege of talking about the Content Authenticity Initiative for a couple of years now. Of course, those couple of years, um, mostly looking at myself on my computer screen, not seeing my uh, audience of various sizes. I think looking out at you all with masks is a good transition back to public speaking, because I can see you. I see most of you are looking at me, but I can't see if you're yawning or frowning or smiling, so it's quite comforting. Um, but it's great to be here. I, I want to thank you all for inviting me. I, this is probably not the typical talk track for this kind of conference, but um, in the spirit of the, the, the organization looking forward, I think it's important to begin considering things like we're rock, working on around uh, digital forensics, and I know there are many experts here in the field. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the Content Authenticity Initiative, why we started it. Let's see, I'm not seeing my slides there. That's okay. Okay, that's an added challenge. <laughs> and I can't walk over there to see my slides. Uh, all right, I'm, I apologize. I'm going to step away for a second now and then to look at the slide. I can't see them. Okay. That is a brilliant idea. Can we get this to work? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Beautiful. Thank you. Um, so, uh, and I'm not wearing my glasses. This is like just full of, this fraught, fraught with challenges. Uh, forgive me in advance. Um, so the Content Authenticity Initiative was started in 2019. Um, at Adobe, we saw a number of challenges to uh, the applications that we produce. Of course, you probably know Adobe as the creator of the eponymous Photoshop used over and over again in, in uh, effectively synonymous with manipulating media for creative purposes, but also for uh, negative purposes. Um, and we saw the you know, onslaught, if you will, of increasingly democratized technologies to create incredibly convincing photorealistic fakes, um, what are now commonly known in our vernacular as deep fakes or synthetic media. Um, and Adobe had a couple of uh, sort of focused areas of interest in this. It's number one, trying to figure out what our role as a, a, a software company, producing incredible tools for creativity for our users, but also kind of seeing the growing wave of misinformation, disinformation, where tools like Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom and Premiere Pro and others could be used for, again, incredible uh, purposes for cre creativity, but also for negative, deleterious purposes to so misinformation and disinformation. Um, and you know, a number of things were looked at. We gathered a, a group in uh, 2019 to look at where software companies could be relevant in this world. Um, and we came to a conclusion, a relatively unanimous conclusion uh, among the attendees there, that we should focus on, um, as the intro indicated, trying to prove what's true rather than trying to post hoc detect what's fake. Um, and in the intervening years since 2019, we have obviously seen real democratization of these incredibly powerful tools. Someone mentioned TikTok, uh, Snapchat, these things that are in the palm of your hand or the, the pockets of your children. I have a teenage daughter. Um, and the remarkable things you can do with TikTok or Snapchat, Snapchat filters uh, rival what you know, was possible with the most expensive uh, Hollywood special effects tools you know, merely five or 10 years ago. Um, so I probably need not sort of you know, tell you about what's happening with the misinformation and disinformation ecosystem. There are countless examples. These are just a few. But you know, the, the combination of um, fake or manipulated photos, videos, and the combination of things that can make them miscontextualized. Um, you may remember in 2020, the, the now well-known Nancy Pelosi so-called cheap fake, um, where someone used extremely unsophisticated means to slow down some frames uh, to indicate or, or you know, show that the Speaker of the House may have been intoxicated or unwell. Um, and that was you know, by no means a deep fake. It was uh, you know, possibly even Adobe tool was used to remove some frames to slow down the audio and make it appear that way. And you know, we're past the days when the genie can be put back in the bottle or retraction can be issued by even a reputable news agency. Um, so this is all around us. You know, I often, I'm often asked, you know, can't we just detect what's fake and is this really a problem yet? And my answer, uh, a bit glib, is you know, how would you even know if we have these incredibly photorealistic sort of 3D mapped, the depth mapped um, simulations of humans and places um, that are be being used for negative effect, uh, we might not even know that we're being duped. Um, 
And on the detection uh, question, you know, there are very sophisticated adversarial artificial intelligence algorithms that can look at fake media or real media, uh, and by real, these are fraught words, I'll get into that in a moment, um, you know, something that was captured directly from photons to a, a camera sensor, or something that's been manipulated. Can't we use these AI detectors to determine what's fake? Uh, and the answer is yes to a certain degree. Um, and I would point you back to the uh, deep fake detection challenge, which was created by Facebook and the partnership on AI where I sit on the Media Integrity Steering Committee. Um, and this uh, challenge, um, it challenged AI experts to come up with an algorithm that could detect fake uh, videos of 10 seconds or so and classify them as you know, real or manipulated or completely synthetic. Um, and it had about a 65% hit rate, the winning algorithm. And obviously at Facebook or Twitter or TikTok scale, that's not much better than a coin toss. Now these are getting better, that was nearly two years ago, but even if you get these things up to 99% accuracy, that 1% at these scales of billions of photos or videos that are being trafficked in every day, um, you know, it's a significant amount that won't be detected. And we think long term, uh, in the Content Authenticity Initiative that, um, you know, for lack of a better way to characterize it, the bad guys will win. Uh, the good guys tend to open source their algorithms and their technologies. Uh, the bad guys don't have to deal with that. They just create better and better uh, fake and synthetic media. So again, we looked at what can we prove about how something was made and whether it's real rather than post hoc detecting uh, whether it's fake. So in my few minutes, I'm gonna tell you a little about what the CAI is, how it works. Um, our path to adoption that we see through standardization and open source code. Um, a couple of applications in forensics, that third one there is not my strong point, and I look forward to speaking with some of you in, at lunch and in the hallway track about how this might be used in your various fields. And then I'll show you some examples of what this looks like in Adobe Tools. Um, we've already talked about this a couple times. I do want to take a moment and talk about these words false and true. We're not talking about proving or detecting or understanding the veracity of what is pictured. You know, we're not proving that something was posed or that a person wasn't actually injured uh, and, and was posing. We're talking about understanding uh, a cryptographically verifiable chain of provenance, as we call it, about how something was made. Um, not necessarily what's in front of the lens, but the techniques that were used uh, after the photons hit the, the sensor, if you will. These are just a few of the logos that uh, represent members of the Content Authenticity Initiative. I'm always delighted to show this slide. I think we're up over 650 members. Um, that's just a number, you know, quantity doesn't, doesn't necessarily uh, mean quality, but you can see by some of these logos, we really do have broad membership in this coalition across hardware, software vendors, NGOs, human rights defense uh, experts, uh, and many others from academia. Um, photojournalists have taken to this idea, video journalists, and we have a lot of uptake. And as I'll show you, some very interesting early implementations uh, that people are using today. So what is this thing all about? I've talked about the problems it solves, it sounds wonderful, now I'm gonna tell you a little about what it actually is. Um, so we use this term digital provenance. This is, um, provenance is a term taken from the art world, uh, as you probably know. If you wanted to know whether something was a Monet or a Picasso, it would be very important to understand uh, how it was made, who made it ideally, who's owned it over the years, what may have happened to it, um, and digital provenance is effectively the same idea, understanding not only the origin story of a piece of content, uh, be it audio, um, video, uh, documents, uh, images, but also how it may have been manipulated along the way. And of course, there's a thing called computational photography, which basically says, you know, before we even see this on our camera rolls, on our iPhones or Android devices, there may have been manipulations, and those manipulations may have used AI technologies to change the lighting. Um, I'll give you an example uh, of the Photoshop Sky Replace technology in your copy of Photoshop, should you be a Photoshop user. Sky Replace not only replaces the sky behind the subject, but it also uses artificial intelligence to relight the foreground so that it appears that someone was standing under those lighting conditions, under, you know, computing the position of the sun and things like that. So that's a manipulation, um, and the Content Authenticity Initiative uh, uh, aims to make sure that there's transparency communicated to a consumer looking at that image so they know what was done. And if you saw a news photo that used Sky Replace or something else and the chain of provenance told you that AI tools were used, uh, you might question that news photo. And that's the kind of transparency that we're ultimately looking for. So why don't we just use existing metadata for these purposes? Um, those of you who are familiar with digital forensics techniques know that there, are, there already is metadata in many photos, uh, there are standards, there are things called EXIF, IPTC, um, 
XMP, which was uh, conceived at Adobe and now is an open standard. These things exist. Many cameras capture them, many devices capture them, many software uh, packages capture them, but they are in no way protected. These are easily co-optable by bad actors. This data can be removed, uh, it can be whole, uh, wholly stripped, um, and it can be edited. So things like GPS coordinates, um, copyright, uh, other details about how something was made that may be captured in those types of metadata, metadata those are very brittle technologies, and they really don't, um, they don't live up to the needs that we have in this age of misinformation and disinformation. CAI, in, in um, contrast, cryptographically seals a block of metadata, uh, attaches it to the image, but I want to be clear, this is not a registry of images or, or videos. This is not a catalog. This is taking a chunk of provenance data, that is inextricably bound to the media that it represents, and that can be stored anywhere. That can be stored in the file, it can be stored in a cloud, it can be recovered, uh, even if someone strips out metadata. Um, and it also can be used to protect these existing types of metadata that we use for forensic purposes now, like XMP and EXIF. Um, so we work on four things in, in uh, pursuit of the goals I've mentioned. Um, most importantly, perhaps, is we're pursuing standards. And we knew that uh, from the very beginning and the inception of this thing, we would not be able to um, put something out like the PDF standard, uh, you know, sort of delivered from the ivory tower of our business as Adobe, um, and make that a worldwide standard that would be adopted by everyone else. But instead, we would need to create this standard in the open with a broad uh, cast of collaborators. So we took this out of the umbrella of Adobe and created a standards development organization called the C2PA, the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. And in that organization, which runs under the governance of the Linux Foundation, um, we are creating a standard. The 1.0 standard was released uh, in January, just a few weeks ago. Um, second, we're looking to implement these technologies with a broad number of um, collaborators, members of the CAI across photojournalism, video journalism, uh, other creative tools. Um, we know that this won't matter in the long run unless there's a broad effort to enhance media literacy with an understanding of what these kinds of things can look like. And at the end of the presentation, I'll just show you some examples to make that a little bit more concrete. Um, and of course, you know, we're also eating our own dog food, as they say, and putting these technologies into the Adobe Creative Suite, starting with Photoshop. And by the way, if you are a Photoshop user and you upgrade to the latest, you have access to this, uh, this feature. So, you know, in terms of guiding principles on the product side, we want to make it very easy, straightforward for anyone, be it a creative professional, a photographer, a forensics photographer with um, a full spectrum camera, to capture this data. Uh, but to make it a, an intentional choice, right? This is not a surveillance technique. We don't want to capture somebody identity, somebody's identity or GPS coordinates if that might put them in danger. Um, and second, make it expected for consumers, and by, by consumers here, I want to define that broadly to mean um, OSINT, open source fact checkers, um, professional fact checkers and news organizations, and ultimately end consumers who are looking at uh, news media, images, video on TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, and these are the, the two key things that we think will lead to broad adoption. Um, so this is sort of a, a kindergarten level diagram of how this all works. Um, I, I hope it's very clear at this point what happens from beginning to end. In this case, we're looking at sort of the story of a photojournalist who takes an image at the top, and then from the top to bottom, we begin to accumulate uh, different parts of this chain of provenance. Something may have been edited, um, may have been shared. Even the simple act of posting something on a social media site like Twitter, one of our partners, um, could result in a manipulation of that media, non-editorial in nature, but you might resample it, you might crop it using algorithms that probably don't reach the auspices of AI, but they do manipulate the image, and it's important for consumers to understand that something has changed, um, and that's what we do here. Ultimately, um, at the bottom, uh, a consumer uh, of any kind, fact checker uh, and consumer on a social media site, news site, will be able to see all of that provenance data should they be interested in knowing what something is and how it came to be. Um, so this is uh, an illustration from the specification of the C2PA that underlies everything we do now that it has reached a 1.0 status. Um, and it shows you that there's uh, you know, a fairly simple binary construction in a file. Um, this is very deliberately uh, designed to cover any number of file types and frankly be extensible. So when we get into the metaverse, whatever your definition might be of the metaverse, um, we'll also be able to use this technology to safeguard um, provenance in, in, that, uh, in that realm as well. 
Um, this is an eye chart. Uh, this is sort of the two-dimensional illustration of what I just showed. And it basically illustrates that there is a, 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 what's called a box format from a long-standing ISO standard. Um, and it encapsulates one what we call claim and attaches it to the next one. So this chain of provenance, not to be confused with blockchain, which could be used to underwrite some of the trust in this model, but um, here I'm referring to a chain of provenance where one claim, which could be this was taken on a Sony camera, um, connected to the next claim, which might say this was edited in Photoshop, and the next and the next. Each one is cryptographically tied to the last. Um, and that's a key concept here because if anything is manipulated, either deliberately by going and trying to dissect a file and change it, or if something is taken off the golden path, mean it's, meaning it's put through a device or a piece of software that doesn't support CAI or that has disabled CAI for malicious purposes, um, we call that tamper evident. So these kinds of changes are evident immediately uh, because at the end of the day, the cryptography, the mathematics behind this don't, uh, do not lie to us. Um, some of the guiding principles around the design of this thing, and I won't go through all of these, but I want to highlight a couple. Um, privacy is a, a absolutely a first-class citizen in all of this. As I mentioned before, we don't want somebody to inadvertently turn on content authenticity, put themselves, their families, their organizations in danger. Um, there is also a facility for redaction, and this goes beyond privacy. This is making sure that information that should not be shared cannot be shared. Um, or can be redacted. And the idea there is uh, we've come up with a way to redact information like identity, perhaps thumbnails. Um, an example would be someone taking photograph or video in a conflict region um, who by the nature of their work must blur out the faces of individuals lest they be identified and, and the subjects put in danger. If those faces are blurred in the ultimate photo or video, we don't want to have a path back via provenance or anything else to recover the unblurred faces. Um, that would put individuals in danger. We want to make sure that's not possible. So we've come up with a way to redact information that should not be shared, should it be captured accidentally, um, without breaking this chain of provenance. So this is still cryptographically verifiable, certifiable, uh, but information that should not be shared can be removed. Uh, and then I want to touch on the last two. Um, interoperability, again, this is not an Adobe-only standard. The only way standards work is if broad coalitions of companies and individuals and practitioners um, get together to test their various implementations and ensure that they're interoperable. Um, unlike many technologies that are useful, this one has to, from its inception, be interoperable, broadly adopted. Um, so camera competitors, competitors of Adobe can all uh, understand each other's data uh, and, and write to this chain of provenance. Um, and that's the extensibility I touched on a little bit. We've already seen cases where certain kinds of hardware, certain kinds of software want to add additional information that's specific to their use cases. And I can think of many, I suspect there are many examples in the forensics uh, fields that would want to do this. So the standard allows for extensibility. Additional data besides the data that we've conceived of can be added uh, and, and also secured. Um, this is really an eye chart for me, standing here sideways. Um, but uh, I, I've sort of lived this path, and I'll just give you some highlights. Um, as I said, the CAI was formed in 2019. We announced it at Adobe Max, which is Adobe's uh, uh, conference for creators that takes place every fall. And we did that in partnership with the New York Times and Twitter, who shared our vision to come up with a way to prove truth, ground truth, about how media is made. Both those organizations, obviously, very interested in fighting mis and disinformation. Um, over the course of 2020, we authored a white paper. Um, myself and some of my colleagues put together some of the basic core ideas of the CAI, many of which I've talked about, published a white paper for public feedback. And that put us on the road to standardization and the formation of the C2PA last year. Fast forward a year to now, we've now, um, we've now created the 1.0 spec, which is publicly available. And I'll talk about some other documents that go along with the spec to kind of safeguards, safeguard its um, purpose and guiding principles. Um, and then we've now released a version of Photoshop that contains this feature called content credentials. And again, if you're a Photoshop user, I'd urge you to investigate and see how it feels. And I'll show you some screenshots of what that looks like. From here, the path to adoption looks like adoption. Um, you know, it's a sort of a self-referential phrase, but uh, we want to see social media, hardware manufacturers take the spec, 
uh, and open source, which I'll talk about uh, in a moment, and implement this just as Adobe is doing and many of our, our friends in the coalition. So I spoke a little bit about the C2PA. These are the founding members of the C2PA. Uh, there are now about 50 contributor members. You can think of this organization as kind of writing the blueprint for a future of verifiable provenance, and then the Content Authenticity Initiative and its association of implementers uh, kind of building this into tools that we use every day. Um, and I mentioned open source, so for those familiar with the idea of an open source ecosystem, this is critically important to the long-term adoption of CAI technologies, and that is uh, that Adobe and other companies putting out open source are not looking to generate revenue from this. Um, we're instead looking to generate adoption. Uh, open source allows somebody to take something off the shelf that's developed in the open, just like the spec itself, put it into their products, and build these interoperable um, provenance-generating applications and devices. Um, so, a couple words on forensics applications. Um, I won't go into this too much since we're short on time, and again, I'd love to catch up with folks uh, who have ideas about how this might be used. But effectively, anything with a sensor um, that can capture information that's important in forensics type investigation is potentially um, a client or user of the CAI technology. Uh, capturing things about date, GPS, um, pixels, resolution, all those kinds of things can be sealed into this chain of provenance. Um, and we think ultimately admissible in a court of law, although it's, it's far too early to say that for sure, but this idea of using cryptography, using digital signatures, um, and reinventing very little, instead using as much off-the-shelf standard technology as possible, um, I think makes this very relevant in the fields of forensics that, that you're all in. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is, you know, we also uh, see a call for this to be used in research integrity. So, for example, we know Adobe Illustrator is used um, across the board in, in many cases to build um, charts, diagrams, and that there's uh, a world of research that is fraught with fraud, uh, fundraising for research. Uh, we know there's a lot of fraud there. Um, so we want to make it possible to use provenance to, uh, to battle against that kind of thing. And I'll close with a couple of examples. Um, this may be too small to see. Uh, this is Photoshop, the current version of Photoshop with the feature called content credentials. And again, I want to make this a little more concrete. I've, I've spoken a lot about what this is and what we intend to do with it. But here's what it looks like in Photoshop. It's early days, um, but this is a fully working end-to-end -end system. Uh, in Photoshop now, there's something called the content credentials panel. You can see it on the right there. Um, important that you notice this is all opt-in. If I don't want to share information about identity, um, or my edit history or things I do in Photoshop, I don't have to do that. The minimal CAI claim, in fact, is a timestamp and a thumbnail. So merely knowing when something was made certifiably, cryptographically uh, verifiable is useful. Um, the simplest and I would say most rife example of miscontextualization is taking a photo from 20 years ago and purporting that it was taken yesterday. And a simple timestamp uh, can resolve that problem. Um, in the middle there, you see a panel that, uh, and I'll, I'll, spoiler alert, it has never snowed on the pyramids of Giza. This is uh, maybe not a deep fake, but it's certainly a fake. Um, that panel in the middle shows you what will be shared with end users who look at this provenance chain. Um, and when you export the image from Photoshop, that will be signed using uh, digital signature cryptography to cement it in the, in the provenance record. Um, this is what this might look like on a social media site. In this case, this is live on Adobe's own Behance site, which is a social media uh, sharing site for our creative users. Um, same data that we saw in the preview is now available here. And if you click that purple button that says view more, you'll be taken to another site that looks like this. This is uh, also live and you, know, you can take a look at it. There are some examples online at verify.contentauthenticity.org. And here you can see that provenance chain on the right. You can see the ingredients that went into it. Could be AI tools, could be other images that were collaged. Um, and you can even see this sort of view that shows you a genealogy of how this came to be. The image we're looking at at the top, the ingredients and the techniques uh, underneath it. Um, and there's even a, an A-B comparison, uh, and we're working on something uh, analogous for video, but here you can take any of the items that went into this image and look at where it started, where it ended, and how it may have changed along the way. 
Um, and I'll close with a couple of real examples also uh, available on the web. This is something the New York Times organization did in their R&D department. Um, they call this secure sourcing, but it uses the same code, the same techniques, the same version of Photoshop. Um, and they did a story around the city waking up from COVID um, and decided to share some of this information that was captured in the Providence chain with their readers. Um, and one of the projects, collaborations that I'm most proud of is the Reuters 78 Days project. Um, this was Reuters sending out a number of photojournalists um, with uh, specially equipped Canon cameras. Um, and they chronicled the 78 days between uh, the election of Joe Biden and his, his inauguration. Um, this is a vast photo essay. I think something like 15 professional photojournalists were involved. Um, and all of the, the photos were edited and produced with uh, CAI data included. And if you mouse over any of the images in that, um, in that portfolio of images, you'll see a little icon indicating that there is provenance data, uh, and you can learn more about it by engaging with that UI. Again, an early example, but ultimately the idea here is that if there's data present that can tell you about where something came from, what it is, we want to expose it to consumers, fact checkers, others. Um, so should you be compelled to look deeper, you'll be able to. And that's something that is just missing on the internet itself today. Um, and with that, I'll close. Uh, again, I would urge you to talk to me if you want to get in touch, if you're interested, if you see applications in your various fields of digital provenance, want to learn more about content authenticity and how we might work together with you, um, get in touch, visit our website, follow us on Twitter. We're not on TikTok yet, but we will be soon, and you can be sure that our TikToks will be authentic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, before the panel uh, takes questions, I want to thank all the speakers and the chair, uh, Doug Lacey. Uh, please give me a well deserved round of applause. Uh, so, if you'd like to come up and ask a question, uh, we'd we'll be happy to answer. I beat you, sorry. Hi. Uh, Good morning. Andy. Um, I'm really curious about uh, social media platform adoption. So you mentioned Twitter, and uh, <clears throat> my <clears throat> excuse me. My concern is uh, currently when when an image is uploaded, not only is it recompressed, but it's also resized. So a lot of changes uh, that they currently apply to images. And I've done a lot of, a lot of research in this area. Um, are they going to adopt it? So when somebody uploads a little check mark says this is authentic. Um, and one step further, are they going to host the original media? So when I, as an investigator, download the image or video, I get what was uploaded and not a recompressed, resized version. Uh, and then beyond that, then how can, how can that be made secure? How are you guys planning on making that secure and you know, scrubbing GPS data and so forth? Yeah, so a lot of that is not prescribed by the CAI or the CTPA standard. It's going to be up to the platform. Um, however, you know, organizations like Twitter, and I think you'll see others joining in the coming year if you keep an eye on the space and what we're doing, um, they do remove uh, metadata often as a matter of course, you know, either to keep file sizes small or to remove, you know, potentially um, private information. So, uh, you know, what we would like to see them do, and I think what they will do, is if they choose to store the original, um, they can do that, it's not required. In fact, it's important for us that, that as I said, this not be a registry, but rather uh, a, um, a way to recover metadata that is secure. And at the end of the day, this system is based on trust. Had I had more time, we would have talked about the trust model, but this is about who the signer of that image is. So there is a notion that um, if Twitter trusts a CDN, a content delivery network, to resize its images, there's a contractual arrangement between those two organizations. One is allowed to sign on behalf of the other. So if you trust Twitter, if it fits your worldview, if, if your worldview is matched by the person who purportedly uploaded that, uploaded that image, um, you can know all that without sort of impeding the privacy of the individual user. So in your example, it would be up to the social media platform to keep the original. Um, but we want to make sure this isn't like reverse image search where you can find all sorts of data that was never meant to be shared uh, in a registry somewhere. So, you know, the near future will tell how this is implemented, but um, as far as we're concerned, as long as there is the possibility of sharing some information about how this was made, um, it's, a, it's a huge leap forward from where we are today. Thanks. Okay, freaking start. Andy, it's a pleasure to meet you at last in person. Um, I just wanted to, to 
stand on a soapbox a little bit and convey a message to the audience to hammer home one of your points um, about the need for us to take active steps to demonstrate that the materials that we are presenting in court are true and accurate representations of what they purport to be. It's not just stuff promoted in Photoshop, but a lot of agencies may be taking photographs of a lot of different things or videos. And if you're going to take that into court, um, with the growth in deep fakes, a lot more people are less likely to trust what is being presented to them. Previously authoritative sources like the government, like the police, like other agencies are more subject to being questioned by the public, by jurors. And so if you are not taking active steps to show that your evidence is authentic, you are setting yourself up for failure. You need to make sure that you can present your evidence in court and you're using things like the Adobe Content Authenticity Initiative standards to do that. So thank you, Andy. And thanks, Doug, for getting Andy on the panel. Thank you, Richard. In determining content authenticity, what about something like a screenshot or a photograph of an already edited image? Would there be a way to backtrack and figure out how it was previously edited before the new image was created? Yes, great question. Um, this is something we think about a lot. It's, it has a name. It's called the rebroadcast problem. And this is you know, simply taking a photo of another photo or a photo of a high-resolution computer monitor. Um, and this happens all the time as well. Would that be a way to strip away the CAI data? Yes, of course, because now you have a brand new asset. Um, a couple things there. Uh, one is there is a facility in the specification that we have built. Um, you'll soon be able to see an example of this where fingerprinting technology can look at the, the, nothing more than the bytes or bits of the image itself or a video and recover the provenance with something like a, a 90 plus percent confidence interval. So on that verify site I showed, you'd be able to drag an image in with no provenance data and recover uh, the cryptographically bound data that may have been stripped from it, even um, if there are some benign manipulations like a photo taken, like an angle change, like noise added, things like that. Um, secondly, if something purports to be news, um, you know, kind of to Richard's point, uh, you will expect it to come with a full chain of provenance. Maybe not back to origin, but if the BBC purports to have delivered something, you should be, you know, you should, it should be crypto cryptographically knowable that it came from the BBC. If you encounter a news image with the BBC logo on it, for example, that doesn't have that, um, you should be skeptical of it. Thank you. Of course. Uh, my question regards the uh, fired cartridge casings. Um, when it comes to the uh, the holders that you were talking about for the casings in order to transport them without them getting mixed in with anything else or any, uh, any of the touch DNA getting wiped away. Um, how would that work with, say, storage at like uh, any lab, really? Um, I take it that those would take up a little more space than just the little paper bags that you would usually see those in. Yeah, so what we typically are saying is you just collect it with that, and then you still put it in an envelope like you normally would. Mm -hmm. And so then you can put, you can still put, you know, 10 or 15 in an envelope if you want to and store it like you normally would. But yeah, they take up a little bit more space. They're not that much bigger than the actual FCCs, but they are a little bit bigger, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Another question for Mr. Bill. Uh, you say it's typical to find mixtures on these cartridges. Are they coming from other perpetrators or perhaps the manufacturing process or handling, you know, sales of cartridges? So that's kind of a, a two-fold answer. Uh, Sean Montpetit, in one of his studies uh, out in San Diego, was taking cartridges right out of the ammunition box, and they were finding DNA on some of those cartridges. He's, I mean, he went to the manufacturer, and was like, these things don't touch human hands, so he wasn't really sure where that was coming from. Um, but also, you know, I've been to some crime scenes and dealt with some crime scenes where you go into the, the gang house and they've got their little lunch bags of the 9 millimeter ammunition, the you know, 40 caliber and whatever. And so, you know, shockingly, they're not going to Dick's Sporting Goods to buy their ammunition. They're buying it off the street. And so, you know, there's a, a bag of all this ammunition. So multiple people are reaching in there. Who knows where it came from before that? And even we've, you know, we'll recover a magazine, like a full magazine from a Glock, and it'll have you know, 10 cartridges and it's fully loaded. And we'll look in that magazine, there's three different manufacturers of ammunition in that magazine because they're all using whatever. So I, you know, it's, 
some of it's coming from the people who are handling it. You know, we're finding that sometimes the girlfriends or even the moms are loading the guns for the suspects before they go out and do the shooting, things like that. So there's a whole whole lot going on there. So we're hoping you know, when we get these DNA profiles, you know, even if it's not leading to the shooter, it's leading to a, a group within, you know, close to the shooter. Thank you. Okay. So that's it for questions. All right. Thank you all.